Welcome to our new study in the book of Revelation. Revelation speaks to our world today. Everyone knows our world is rapidly changing. Come and see how God already knew about it. You will discover it's easier to understand than you thought. Sometimes it's hard for me to remember you on you. The pace of life just gets so out of hand. I try my best, but it's just never good enough. I'm reminded of how much I need to know. You are for me, you're not against me. You are with me. I'm not alone through all the darkest times and brightest days. I know. It's so good to welcome you back with us again this week, and we are going to have just a really an amazing conversation. Uh, did you know that in the book of Revelation, there were two churches that got it, that not only got it, but practiced and figured it out? In fact, they were so, in, how do I want to say, so in Christ that they were able to do church, are you ready for this? And did not get a call to repentance. In the seven churches we're studying in Revelation 2 and 3, five of those churches get called to repentance. Two got it. So today we're going to look at those two churches. I'm breaking my own rule. I'm kind of stepping out of the order of the churches. But I need you to see two churches side by side that figured it out. So that someday your church and mine can figure it out. That's exciting. Let's take a moment and just enjoy the story that Sherry has captured. Uh, there's one of those tiger butterflies. And the purple flowers, this is so appropriate for southern Idaho here. Those are alfalfa blossoms. And of course, if you're anywhere close to an alfalfa field, you know exactly what alfalfa blossoms look like. And that butterfly came... And Sherry was able to get so, it just like came and posed for her. It's like, oh, Sherry's here with the camera. Let me get right in front. There's pictures in this story in the background. You can't quite see them because of the way the focus is. But there's several colts and their moms laying in the shade on a hot day. And this butterfly came along and Sherry just captured the moment. Thank you, Sherry. It's absolutely beautiful. Well, we've got to jump right in. We've got a lot of things to talk about today. So, are you ready? Revelation Now is a book that speaks to the present now, right now, today. The book of Revelation is God shares his thoughts with us. We are into the mind of God in the book of Revelation. John is the scribe. God is telling John and giving him images and saying, John, record these so that you could watch this program today. We're in Revelation 2 and 3. This is the second part. And I just know you're going to be blessed. I just know that what you're going to hear today is going to be amazing. And it's going to be good news. So, two perfect churches. Here they are. Smyrna and Philadelphia. Two perfect churches. Now, I'm sure we all think our church is perfect. But wait till you meet these two. So, we have in the seven churches, we have Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, Laodicea. Notice I've highlighted Smyrna and Philadelphia. Those are the two we're talking about. So, it's the second church in and the next to the last church. And maybe God chose those churches to be in this position for a reason. Now, those seven churches are on an ancient mail route. In other words, if you were delivering mail, you would get on your donkey or your pony or your chariot, and it was approximately a day's journey before you got to the next church and then the next church. So it was a timeline of unfolding day by day. It would take almost a full seven days to get the mail delivered in a time sequence. So our principle here is that there's an individual messages the individual messages, let me say my own notes correctly, are applicable to all churches, past and present. 
There is a literal message and a prophetic time era for each church, and I'll introduce you to that today. The churches fit a timeline that starts in the first century and sequentially representing the changing eras of the church all the way down to the coming of Christ. So we want to look at those messages in their time, and then we want to look at the message as it unfolds in the time of history. This approach allows us to know what successes or what errors not to repeat, because don't we learn from those who have come before us? And in the seven churches, we have a lesson today of two churches that got it. That's what we want to learn. But in the other five churches, we want to learn the errors not to repeat today. Isn't that amazing how God gave this to us? To the church of Smyrna, I'm giving it a prophetic era of somewhere between 100 AD and 313. I have my reasons. We'll talk about that as we go through. But listen to what John recorded. To the angel, that's the messenger, of the church in Smyrna, write, these are the words of him who is the first and the last. That's the Alpha and the Omega we spoke of earlier. Who died and came to life again. That's the resurrected Christ. I know your affliction and your poverty, yet you are rich. I know the slander of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not be afraid of what you are about to suffer. I tell you, the devil will put some of you in prison to test you. You will suffer persecution for 10 days. Be faithful, even to the point of death, and I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear, ear let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes will not be hurt by the second death. So two things there, the crown of life, eternal life, and victory over the second death. That would be the eternal death, a death from which there is no return. Now that is a lot to take in, isn't it? So I'm going to tell you a story. This is an ancient story. In the Church of Smyrna was a church member called Polycarp. He was the last of what is called the great 12 great martyrs, and he was from Smyrna in the second century. Let me just read the story to you. The story is told that Polycarp was at a farmhouse when the soldiers came. He asked that a meal be prepared for the soldiers, and during the two hours it took to prepare the meal, he prayed aloud for every Christian in the Smyrna church. The soldiers brought him before the governor, who was so impressed with Polycarp that he tried to save his life. Because of the demands of the people, he was thrown to the lions. However, as the story goes, the lions would not eat him. They were full from the non-Christians they had just finished. Now the Jews who made the accusation against him were so angry, they demanded he be burned. Even though it was Sabbath, they gathered wood, and Polycarp was burned alive at the stake in the Colosseum. Now, you just need to know something about religious history. You need to know that in the Jewish culture, if you go back and read Exodus and Leviticus, you will discover that it was a death penalty to go out and gather wood on the Sabbath. But these Jews who were not Jews, who were of the synagogue of Satan, were willing to compromise their own belief system to put this Christian man to death. I need you to understand the tension that happened during this first century and the second century between the Christian church and the Jewish church. It was intense, and you see that in this story. So let's look at the persecution of the church of Smyrna. What I put on this slide for you is that there were three kinds of persecution. There was sporadic persecution that was mostly localized. We have Trajan, Hadrian, Marcus Aurelius. You can see that from 98 AD to about 117, and then Marcus Aurelius about 161 to about 180. There was general systematic persecution. Uh, Decius and Valerian, 249 to 251, 253 to about 259. 
But I want you to pay special attention to the political oppression and massacre. Now, notice how the intensity is growing here. Diocletian went after the church with wrath and rage in oppression and massacre. Polycarp was an illustration of that story. Now, Diocletian persecuted the church from 303 to 313. Now, if you do the math on that, is it any coincidence that it comes out exactly 10 years? Is it just any coincidence? I'm going to reread to you again just briefly. It says, The devil will put some of you in prison to test you, and you will suffer persecution for 10 days. Be faithful even to the point of death. And here we have Diocletian doing a day for a year, exactly 10 years of persecution. That does not fit any other one of those stories, but it fits this one perfectly. So, under the persecution of Diocletian for those 10 years of severe persecution fits exactly what John saw in Revelation 2.10. 10 days of persecution. And remember last presentation, we talked about how in prophetic time, God said one day equals one year. So that would equal 10 prophetic years of persecution according to the principles of an interpreting prophetic time. Now, being God that is God, isn't, isn't God able to be precise and right on time? Right on the number of days and the number of years? This is just one of those fingerprints that you see God has on prophecy that shows you that God has already seen what's going to unfold for this church. Let's dig deeper into the church of Smyrna. Smyrna loved to tell the story of Jesus, no matter what was going on. If there was persecution, they did not stop. No problem. They just found ways to continue to tell the story. Executions, did they run and hide and stop? No, they continued. No problem. Let's go tell the story. The more they told of his love, the more they loved. The less they had, the more they loved. God, in his examination of the church of Smyrna, could find nothing in this church to call it to repent of. How does that church compare to yours and mine? Do we have something profound to learn from this church that suffered oppression and massacre, and yet they could not stop telling the story of the love of Christ, that how God in Christ loved this world and desired to save the entire world in Jesus. Do you find yourself in that story? Do you find yourself in that story saying, you know, that, that, that's me? Or are we more like being honest, say, you know, that's what I would like to be? Do I really know this Jesus that Smyrna knew? That you couldn't stop me from telling the story? Do you know Jesus in such a way that how he has delivered you in your life from sin that you can hardly wait to include him in a conversation with your friends in a kind, caring, careful, appropriate, timely way? We need to jump in now to the Church of Philadelphia in Revelation chapter 3. I gave a prophetic timeline, and these are general times. Don't, don't, I, I'm not dogmatic about this, but the Church of Philadelphia, and, and there's a good reason that I estimate the prophetic time of Philadelphia. There's the literal time, the day they received the letter, but there's a prophetic era that matches Philadelphia in a remarkable way. And that's from sometime in the late 1790s up into the mid-1800s. I'll show you why in just a moment. But let's read what John wrote. The angel, the messenger of the Church of Philadelphia, write. Now remember, God is speaking this, revealing it to John. I am coming soon. Now notice the timeline here. This message applies to the church in its day, but it reaches down to the time in which God says, I'm sending my son soon. So it has a message towards the end of time as well. 
hold on to what you have. In other words, as God is looking at the history of this church, he says, hang on to something you have discovered here so that no one will take your crown. And him who overcomes, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God. Never again will he leave it. I will write on him the name of my God. Let's pause here for just a moment. Everybody I know has a first name. I'll be honest, I've never met someone without a last name because I'm part of Western civilization, I guess. But have you ever thought about what it means for God to write his name? If you're a son and daughter, does that give you a new last name? I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem. That means city of peace which is coming down out of heaven from my God. And I will also write on him my new name. So now you have God's name and you have a new name of Jesus. And then he says, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He's saying, will you just put your rebellion away? Will you just stop and listen up? Will you just pause for a moment and pay attention? Listen, the Church of Philadelphia was a church that had brotherly love. Now, on the slide there, you can see Philadelphia. The first part, phila, or philos, means loving your brother. I love my brother, philos. Delphia is the word for brother. Philos is love. That's family love. Delpha is brother, the city of brotherly love. If you go to Philadelphia, they will say right there when you drive into town, the city of brotherly love. It was a church that had love for each other. Now listen carefully. A church with affection for each other and for their community is the church of Philadelphia, prophetically. God could find no need for repentance. The success of a church is found in uniting together and sharing the gospel. We learned that in Smyrna. But if you embrace the gospel, then you've embraced the love of God for your brother. If a church is focused on moving towards humanity with the good news of Jesus, they fulfill Christ's vision for the church we see demonstrated in Smyrna and in the church of Philadelphia. You see, God designed the church to be a vessel of God's agape, unconditional love that has its joy in loving freely as Christ's love, loving with his love, loving through his love, means that you love with something gifted to you outside of yourself. Because humans do not possess agape love naturally. We possess brotherly love more naturally. Agape love? that made Philadelphia so rich was the love of God manifested in the church towards one another. So what is God's part in making the church what he wants it to be? How does God make Smyrna, Philadelphia churches in your church and mine? How does he make the church what he wants to be? Because I keep telling you, there's no human thread in the garment. There's no human fingerprint. It's by faith alone in Christ. So I'm going to take you on a journey through some texts. And naturally, we'd have to begin with John, who wrote this letter as a revelator to begin with. Dear friends, let us love one another. That's agape love one another. For agape love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. And whoever does not agape love does not know God because God is agape, unconditional love. That's what God is. First John 4 verse 9, this is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. That's beautiful, isn't it? I have made known, I will read this correctly, I have made you known to them and will continue to make you known in order that the love you have for me may be in them and that I myself may be in them. Now that's John 17, 25 and 26. Now listen carefully. That's Jesus' prayer 
to his Father. This is the Lord's Prayer. This is the real Lord's Prayer. This isn't the prayer that Jesus taught the disciples. This is Jesus' request before his re crucifixion to his Father. I have made you, Father, known to them. I will continue to make you, Father, known in order that the love you have for me will be in them. That's in the church, in you and in me. That I myself may be in them. The love of Christ manifested. The love of Christ in action. Let's look at Romans 5.5. 5. God has poured out his agape love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit whom he has given us. God has poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit. Did you know you possess, as a Christian, no matter who you are, you are in possession of God's love poured into you by the Holy Spirit. The question is, are you willing today to embrace that love and allow it to manifest itself in you towards the world, towards your neighbor, towards your brothers and your sisters? 1 John 3, 1. How great is the agape love the Father has lavished on us? That we should be called the children of God, and that is what we are? First Thessalonians 3.12 May the Lord make your love increase and overflow for each other and for everyone else, just as ours does for you. You see, the Lord is at work making the church what he wants it to be and what he wants it to look like and act like so that when it embraces the world, it points towards the unconditional love he has for every human being. Some people make their church about being right about everything. Some people make their church exclusive about being just for those who think and act like they do. But God's vision of the church in Smyrna and God's vision of the church in Philadelphia was a church that moved outward. So I want to take you on a journey, our part of making the church all it can be. If you have the love of God in you, here's our part. Jude 21, keep yourselves in God's love as you wait for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to bring you to eternal life. That would be the second coming of Christ. A new commandment I give you, agape one another. It's not optional here, it's a commandment, it's an imperative. This you must do. As I have loved you, you must. That's another imperative. You must agape one another. By this the whole world, all men, all women, will know that you are my disciples. That's if you have agape one for another. Now, this is God's vision of the church manifested in Smyrna and Philadelphia, but this is God's vision to be manifested in your church and mine. The only thing that counts, this is probably one of the most stunning passages of Scripture of all Scripture that I could possibly share with you. If you stop and think about your church, we all have an opinion of what we think is the most important thing in the church. We have the truth that we think is the most important above all other truths. Maybe the most important truth in your church is John 3.16, whosoever believes in him. And so that's the mantra that you take to the world. Wonderful. There isn't a thing wrong with that. Some people have a mantra that say, well, you know, our church has the only worship service that does, and you have your list of things that you believe is true. Some people say, well, my church has this scholar and that scholar or this prophet and that prophet, and it's the only true church. And so you have that mantra that you play. Now, I don't want to take away from that. that. That's deep personal conviction. But I do want to challenge it. And it's not me challenging it. Paul himself wants to challenge it. Now, before I give you the text, I'm going I'm to walk you through Paul for just a moment here. You need to understand that Paul's journey, when he had an encounter, he was given a vision of Christ. Paul, Paul, why do you persecute me? And Paul was an intellect of intellects of his time. 
And Paul, in meeting Christ in that vision, when he was blinded, was healed from his blindness and received the love of God in his heart and the love of Christ in his heart and became the greatest evangelist the church had ever known in its time. Maybe one of the greatest evangelists in all time. So understand that when we go back to Paul, there's something unique about Paul. We have the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John present the Gospel in oral tradition. But you see, John, I mean, sorry, Paul had Western thought, Roman thought in his head. So he's thinking more like people of the West think, not so much oral tradition, but more of actual what, what is truth kind of thing. So when Paul writes something, he's writing the gospel for the Western church. And listen to what he says. The only thing that counts. Just let that resonate for just a minute. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. So when I told you the era of the Philadelphia churches in that late 1700s on up to the mid-1800s, the era of Philadelphia as a church prophetically is known for persons like Dr. Livingston and like the American Bible Society, a time in which the church began to embrace a global mission. That's why I believe that's a good prophetic window to say here's the manifestation of the Church of Philadelphia. But can you and I embrace a little bit of Smyrna and a little bit of Philadelphia? And can we allow God to make our church everything he wants it to be? You see, when you do the seven churches, it challenges you to think about your church and about how you do church. We're going to Sherry's picture, coast of Oregon. Again, the fog's rolling away from the morning sun as it warms up on the surface of the earth, and it's just moving that fog off into the distance sun is out. When I see this picture, I get up close, I can almost see the sand rolling underneath the tide as it is moving through that beach beautifully. Such a clear day, one of those beautiful stacks. On the right-hand side, about halfway up, there's actually a little hole all the way through in which you can see the blue sky, a little teeny dot there. Thank you, Sherry, for that story. I just love the ocean. I could live there at least until a tsunami came. It's a beautiful place, isn't it? Will you go to a beautiful place and embrace God's love in your life today? Can't wait to see you next week. Blessings now. Enjoy the picture. Thank you, Sherry. Bye-bye. Watching today. Our email address is screamingrockministries at gmail.com or drop us a note to Screaming Rock Ministries, P.O. Box 5622, Twin Falls, Idaho, 83303.